we're going to get started tonight understanding God's design for the local church. This is chapter 8. If you have your book, it's about page 81 and 82 going into 8182. And uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I ask that you would please let your word speak, not so much some uh, book that we're going through. I thank you for Dr. Ketchum and how he's being a blessing to us by kind of leading an outline of direction. But I pray, Lord, that we would grow in grace and understanding in these days. Father, I need you in a special way. Lord, these folks need you in a special way. Lord, you know, we have sick people here, and some people have come don't feel well here tonight. And it's snowed, and the weather's doing all kinds of things. In the midst of all this, Lord, let us be so glad that we came to the house of the Lord. And help us tonight to be fed. Please, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 10. If you would, we'll get there in a moment. We have talked about a lot of the crazy kind of things that are going on in Christianity today and specifically some attacks uh, that have come to the church that are very, very new in the way of in the last 10 years or 15 years or even less than that in the last couple years. And we got into talking about uh, what exactly is a church biblically and I think it's so important for us to understand this and I think that it's going to be even more important that we teach our children that. Now let me stop. Let me really let me tell you here. If things continue to go the way they are today, a church like Lighthouse Baptist Church, Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, will hardly be found anywhere in 50 years. Okay? Now I'm praying because there's some men that are they are seeding America again with good independent fundamental churches. All right? They realize that we are a dying breed. I believe uh, the statistic is like 4,000 churches a year shutting down, okay? We, please understand, there's a major attack that Satan has on the church. Some of it plays into the book of Revelation, the end times. I, I know it does, but that should not cause us uh, to fail to teach our children what a church should be. And there's a lot of people that are disoriented with churches, and a lot of people even in this auditorium here tonight have been burnt by churches. And I think that there needs to be a, a defense and a teaching about what a Bible church looks like from verses, real verses. I want to start off tonight by just because that sometimes I sense in working with people that there's a discouragement about the direction of the church. I want to give a little bit, a, a very short testimony about what my local church did in my life for you to have courage about what your local church can do in your life and then for you to have courage to be able to teach your young people not to lose sight of how a local church can help them in their lives and to have confidence that it can help your family and your grand babies. When my parents went to Morgantown, West Virginia, they came from a Mennonite background and they tried to find the most conservative church that they could find. Uh, at, there was no Mennonite church there, and they went to the most conservative church that they could find, which was a uh, faith Baptist church in Morgantown that met in a fire hall. Okay, It was brand new. Pastor Moran was straight out of B uh, Bob Jones, and he had started this church, and he had been in the military, and then went to BJ. And, and at that time, there were a lot of guys, even in this area, that were starting churches. God was doing an incredible work 40 years ago. So imagine what was going on 40 years ago. Some of you remember what was going on in independent fundamental churches, it was a great thing, a powerful thing. There were some men that were on fire for God. And he started in that fire hall, and my parents joined him the year, so they went, I guess I'm a Baptomite, I'm not sure exactly what I am, but uh, he, they started going to that church. Right after that, the church purchased property and began with their own hands building a little building on the Green Bag Road in Morgantown, West Virginia. And the men built this building. That was the only church building I ever knew growing up. And I remember that my, my parents contributed financially, and they also tr uh, contributed with, with work. My father was gone many nights of the week, plumbing, helping to plumb in the new church. And I remember when we got in that building, and now looking back, it was just a little like shack of a building or a little whatever, shadow of a building, but what great things God did for my family there. And what great things God did for many people's family. And there's many preacher boys all over the country that came out of that work that, that the Lord put on Pastor Moran's heart. But having said that, during that time, there were some hard times. There were some church splits. 
And though my father at that time was a businessman, and I remember around the kitchen table talking about, well, the, you know, the fa I, I almost said the names of the families. I better not. But the, the names of this family is going to leave, and this family. I remember there was one big, really big split where 10 families or 15 families disagreed with something, and they left. And I praise the Lord that my, pa or that my father decided that he wasn't going to uproot his family and that he, re he stayed the course even through that. And then it became very personal when my oldest sister uh, fell into fornication and conceived out of wedlock and uh, my, stood before my, the church and confessed because that was what the, the leadership wanted her to do. And as she confessed there, and my father was a deacon at the time, and he lost his position of being a deacon. And I remember, you know what, to this day I look back and I praise God that through that whole thing, and that, that was very embarrassing for my family and for my sister and for my father losing his position. My, my parents did not leave. They didn't badmouth the church. They submitted and came through that. And I remember some situations that were hard. My, the youth pastor that my brother had, his name was Bill Dunn. And uh, he ran away with a, a girl in our youth group. And I remember that could have been very discouraging. And I had all the faith in the world in that guy. And he left. Through all of that, the local church throughout all the years, the church that my, my family still attends, was, it was a rock to us and greatly, greatly influenced my brother becoming a pastor, me becoming a pastor, and my sister being a, my other sister being a pastor's wife. There were some men in that church and ladies just like you that had a huge influence on our lives. I remember a guy by the name of of uh, Mr. Van Kirk, who was one of my Sunday school teachers, my and he, I looked up to him, and I and he was a godly man. He was he worked in the mines. He was a miner, but he poured his life into those lessons. And as he gave those lessons, us boys were influenced. I was called during I was called to the ministry in his Sunday school class. I wasn't there. I was away. But I remember coming back and writing him a note, Mr. Van Kirk. I want you to know that I gave my heart to the Lord to be a pastor, to be a preacher, and giving that note to him as a junior higher. There was Mr. Ted. He was the faithful junior church. He still to this day teaches junior church. And what an influence, a godly man. His, his wife wasn't saved, but he kept coming, being faithful, and he taught that junior church, and he used to do object lessons, all kinds of things. Put on, he bring his turkey gobbler and, and go, 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 and give illustrations of how, how the devil will fool you and things like that. There are people within that church, and as, new, as recent then as my dad's incarceration, when that happened, very hard time, and yet our church was a great rock. Why am I saying all this? Because there's an attack on the local church, and you must not lose sight of that the local church is owned by Jesus Christ, and it's the best thing going. Amen. And it greatly influenced my life, and it will greatly influence your family. And some of you, your children, your grandchildren, aren't going to church right now. Don't, don't, don't give up and hoping and wishing and talking to them about getting back in church because it stabilizes a family and it stabilizes life. And God does great things in individuals' hearts in local, in local churches, good Bible preaching local churches. That's my personal testimony to encourage you that God is still using the church and he wants to continue to use the church. We already talked a little bit about what the church is biblically. You look up here, you can follow along. It's on about page 81 or 82. We are going very loosely through those pages, and I change points and kind of leave points off and add points, so if you can't find it, that's okay. What is local church? We've already covered the local church involves only believers. Church members must be baptized. Local church is organized, has human authority, offices, and accountability. We talked about that. And some of this are, these are direct points arguing some of the things that are going on in churches today or not in churches, like in home churches, or get rid of the church, or as I was listening to 106.9 today in Harold Camping Land, where radio church and God has left the church, and all that crazy heresy, okay? Notice the last thing, members must hold to Bible doctrine. We talked about that the uh, church continued in the apostle, in, in the gospel, and in the apostles' doctrine, and the importance of doctrine. Tonight we want to plunge into new ground, and that's the, the next letter. What is the church biblically? The church, uh, the local church assembles regularly. Some people may want to think that it's not important to come to church. And uh, I think that it's wrong when you turn into some kind of attendance police. 
It's wrong when nobody at Lighthouse Baptist Church, you know, takes attendance and calls you up and says, you haven't been here or whatever. I hope that the leadership notices or deacon notices when you're not here or whatever. But they're atten you're not more, you know you're not more spiritual because you go to church more often, right? Does everybody know that? You know, you're not punching a card and everybody who has the most punches wins, okay? It's not like that at all. However, God, in, God encouraged and provided that we would be at the local church regularly. Acts 2.46, you remember that early passage that says that they continued daily with one accord. They actually met after Pentecost. They, they met on a daily basis. And I know that they all lived in one city and it was easy for them to come and whatever. And I'm not advocating coming to church every day. You realize that. The preacher's not for that you be at church all the time. In fact, let me just tell you something, one thing that I think is important about ministry. I think you need to get a ministry in, the, in this local church, and you need to be real faithful to that ministry, but don't allow yourself to get sucked into every ministry, or it could provoke your children to anger that they never have family time. That may be surprising for you to hear. We try to hold back the calendar so that we don't have something going. I have been my brother's church. Uh, he, had, he, he got to the place where they had something going almost every night. Okay, that's unhealthy. Okay, I don't think that there's anything spiritual about that. But there is value in being at the services and assembling regularly in the church. Notice please in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23 that it talks about this. Now we've been preaching through Hebrews, so this should be familiar ground to you. Um, you'll notice in verse number 21, it's coming off talking about Jesus Christ being our high priest. In verse 22, it talks about because he is our high priest, we can draw near to him. And then it starts transitioning in verse 23. It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of such is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, most guys just pluck out verse 25 and just say, you know, don't forsake the assembly. But look at the context here. Why is it important that we assemble regularly as Christians? Forget about church service times. Forget about, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, that kind of stuff. Why is it important that we are together? And this would include from the point where you come in and you fellowship beforehand and afterward and, and, uh, Things like church picnics and fellowships and deacons caring group times and why is it important? And of course, services and preaching. Well, notice here there's several things listed here. I, I just want you to kind of scan verse 23, 24, and 25. Look at 23, less whole fast of profession or faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Now look, and let us consider one another to provoke unto, unto love and unto good works. First thing there is accountability. How can I provoke you if I'm not with you? You say, preacher, you provoke us a lot, <laughs> okay? I don't mean, that, that's a good kind of provoke, to love and to good works. The idea is they would come together and they, you know, the whole idea is that I'm encouraging you and you're encouraging me that, that together we should be doing love and good works. That we, you know, that's not the natural tendency of your body. The natural tendency of you Christian is just to be by yourself and isolated and reading a book and by yourself and having your own time, okay? This, we are to come together. One of the reasons here in verse 25 is that we would provoke each other to love and good works. It's the idea of accountability to, to cause each other to serve the Lord. There's strength in numbers. The Bible says a threefold cord is not quickly broken. What does that mean? Well, you have three strands of a cord, you wrap it around, it's a lot stronger than one, isn't it? When we come together and we see each other serving the Lord and we talk about serving the Lord and we encourage each other to serve the Lord, something happens. There is more service to the Lord. There's more love and provoking each other to good works. Then in the passage there, it says, talks about fellowship, just fellow ministry. Notice what it's talking about, provoking unto love and to good works. Well, who are you doing the good works to? A lot to each other. This is in... Hebrews 10, 23, I see some of you looking at the verse. If you can't see it there, you can find it in your Bible. Verse 24, I believe, is where we're, we're at there. Well, who are you doing the good works to? To each other, okay? There's this matter. Let me ask you a question. How can you minister to somebody that you're not with? The idea of coming together as a church is that you know about how I've shown you in the scriptures that the Lord has given you each spiritual gifts and when we're with each other and we're talking with each other and we're doing things for each other 
and we are loving each other and doing good works, you're ministering to each other. So the whole idea of being together, we are to be ministering while we're together, and that has to do with fellowship. You say, Pastor, I thought fellowship's when you ate together. It really is not. Fellowship is, is fellow ministering to each other. And you can surely do that around cake and banana pudding and things like that, right? All right, notice that there's also here the preaching of each other. Look at verse the end of verse number 25. Exhorting one another or, you know, the idea of giving the word or, or preaching to one another. If not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as manner some is, but exhorting one another. Let me ask you a question. Do you need to be preached at? Yes or no? All right, but that preaching isn't only, only from this pulpit. And it's not only from your Sunday school class. And it's not only from some teaching ministry here. All right, there is a lot of preaching that goes on in little conversations around. There really is. I came in tonight and I heard one of you preaching God's word to another person, saying ver a verse to another person, preaching before the sermon. That's we need to be together to hear that. We need to be together to get that. I need that. I need that encouragement. You need that encouragement. Not forsaking. So the local church assembles regularly. The last thing there in verse number 25, so much the more as you see the day approaching. I love that. You know, how many of you have noticed that there's a trend in modern churches to have less services? How many of you, how many of you know that? Hello? Have you been around? Ho! All right, just go out on a drive on Sunday night to the local churches and see if you can find anybody open, okay? I'm not just saying that. I mean, there's the whole thing about, you know, farmers and why we have a Sunday morning service and Sunday evening service. Maybe you don't know that, but that's all right. But the point is that in this verse, it says that we ought to gather more as we see the day approaching. Judgment day, rapture, whatever day you want to assign to that, that could be argued, I guess, but we know what it means, the end of time, right? So God's idea is that we would get together all the more because Christians would come together all the more, not all the less, because we know that the rapture is coming or the day of judgment is coming. And how much do we need to comfort one another, especially in a wicked day like ours? All right, so the local church assembles regularly. I want to go to another point here. The local church is independent. You'll notice in your book, the handbook there, this is point three. I think it's on page 82 uh, or the beginning of 81. That's where it is. They're down at the bottom. The local church is independent, self-rule. There's a lot of argument about this today. These point, four points is what I want to cover. A points, it's a, because it appoints its own leaders, it shows that it's independent. It carries out its own dis discipline. It settles its own conflicts. And leaders represent their own church. These four points are what we're going to cover over the next couple slides, a couple points here, but I want you to understand what I'm doing. We need to go back to the Bible and look to how the Bible and the epistles explain the local church. I have a brother-in-law who's a free Presbyterian, and in their church order, uh, they have a presbytery, which means that he uh, answers to a pastor or an elder higher than him and there are certain things within their church that they can and cannot do there's sometimes they go to meetings and they decide how they're going to do some things within their churches so it's not him as a pastor leading his flock he answers to someone higher or a greater group if you think about Southern Baptist churches and their cooperative board that they have and some other churches, there is often in denominations a hierarchy. Well, then why is Lighthouse Baptist Church an independent church? Why did you grow up perhaps in an independent church? Why, do we be, why are we independent? Because we believe that the scriptures, and I'd like to show you some verses, talk about the independence of a church and that a church does not come under the hierarchy of another ruling body, okay? This isn't only in Catholicism with, you know, the, the priests and the bishops and the cardinals and all that. It's also in certain Protestant denominations or non-Catholic denominations, like I told you, the Free Presbyterian Church. We would say that the Free Presbyterian Church is a fundamental church. They certainly preach a, uh, the true, the only right and true gospel. But I think that there's problems when we come to this matter of hierarchy. I want you to notice, please, the idea of the church being independent because the first point appoints its own leaders. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, you, you know what that is. You can turn there if you want to. It is all the qualifications that we go over once a year when we pick pastors and deacons. 
I want you to note something that the, the qualifications there were given to local churches so that they could pick their own leaders. The qualifications, men were to be proved in verse number 10, 1 Timothy 3 verse 10. They were to be proved and there was a choice process. The idea was that each of these local churches would look at who was, who was qualified to be the pastor and at that point they were choosing, it wasn't you know, the kind of communication, the kind of bringing in pastors I don't think from other places. They were picking those that were in their congregation, someone who the Lord raised up to be the pastor, and they were looking at deacons and had the qualification. The point is this, it wasn't some outside body that was doing it for them, or they would never have gotten the qualifications. In 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus, the qualifications are given to you people, you laymen, youenses, so that you would know who was qualified in your church to be leaders. Someone might say, well, the Bible says in Titus 1 and in verse number 5, why don't you turn over there because I want you to see this straight out. Titus chapter 1, verse number 5. Someone would argue that the apostles chose who the pastors of the churches were going to be, or the elders. Because in Titus chapter 1 and verse number 5, the Bible says, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, are lacking, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee, if any be blameless, and that goes on the husband and gives more qualifications. Titus was an ambassador of the apostle Paul sent to the churches. All right, Sometimes he functioned kind of like a pastor. But let me point out something here uh, about this passage. When you look at the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 that were given to local churches to make the decision, and you also realize when the first deacons were chosen, stay with me, this is, this is you got to logically think through this. When the first deacons were chosen, did the apostle choose the deacons, yes or no? Yes or no? What did they do? They told the congregation, find you seven men among you, full of the Holy Spirit, and, and that we may appoint over this business. They nominated them, or they brought them, and the apostles approved them. Okay, Understanding the process that happens there. When Titus is sent to the churches, someone may argue that he picked the elders. However, in 1 Timothy 3 and even below this, there are qualifications given for the church to find men that were uh, qualified and appoint them as leaders, pastors, and deacons. I believe Titus went to the churches, but he allowed the church congregation because of the qualifications to appoint these men. He just was a helper of doing it. That's kind of obvious to me from Acts chapter 6 when the apostles had the congregation choose. Why am I saying all this? Because we don't need a presbytery. God, by His Holy Spirit, will help you nominate and bring men of this congregation to be deacons and ultimately you vote to choose the pastor of this church. And God ordains the independence of a local church to be able to do that in 1 Timothy 3. And here in Titus chapter 1, he gives the qualifications to do it. If some presbytery or for instance in the, I believe it's the Methodist church where they send you a pastor for so many years and then he goes to the next church and to the next church, whatever. If you needed somebody to do that, some body, B-O-D-Y, some ruling body to do that, the Lord would not have given the church the qualifications to pick these men. He would have given them to a presbytery somewhere. The local church is independent. Let me show you another reason that biblically why they're independent. Because they're given the power to carry out their own discipline. Turn over to Matthew chapter 18 in your Bible. Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew 18, let's be very clear. Jesus Christ was setting up or teaching his disciples who would be apostles 
how the local church was going to be started and formed. There's a great argument. Did Jesus Christ, even in your book, did Jesus start the church or did the apostles? I think that's a semantical argument. I don't think it matters. Jesus Christ laid, it's his church. He laid the foundation of it and the apostles and, and uh, the disciples and the apostles carried out how that would work, okay? So some people getting big, big B Baptists getting big arguments about this, who started the church. I think it's a silly argument, okay? But notice as Jesus lays the framework in Matthew chapter 18, in verse number 15, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then, then take with thee one or two more than the mouth of two or three witnesses. Every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, uh, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask and it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. This is one paragraph. Right? Some people pull, pull, pull those verses. How many of you heard like a, a, a preacher pull the the passage out of the bottom, the verses out of the bottom. If we would just agree for this thing, then this healing's going to come. If we'll just agree, two of us will agree. You know, okay, that is pulling it right out of context. The context here is church discipline. And it's talking about privately a church being able to discipline a person out of the church and what these people would get together and agree on as a church, God would honor from heaven. Even if it's a small church of two or three, Okay, that is the context here. How does that show that a church is to be independent? Because everything that happened in the discipline happened within the local church. There was no apostle that was coming. There was no presbytery that needed to come. Even if there was a small church of two or three in this passage, they could practice church discipline and God would honor that discipline in heaven. By the way, let me just tell you this. This is why church discipline is a scary thing because God honors it in heaven. And what he talks about when, when someone uh, goes away from God and will not repent and eventually they're brought before the church or their name is brought before the church and they are dismissed from a church, that is scary business because God promises destruction and he allows Satan to do that and he honors that in heaven. But what I want to point to you is that this is a proof the, of independence of the local church that we don't need a presbytery over us or a convention over us to tell us what to do. In this passage, church discipline was carried out even by a small group independently. Let's go to the next idea. Carries out its own discipline. Well, just the command of the, the church discipline all, also, as we talked about last week, is another strong argument for church membership. All believers are to bring themselves under the accountability of a local church. How can you be disciplined if you're not a member? I made that strong point to you last week of the importance of church membership. Here in conflicts, the last step of conflict, if you won't make some, something right with somebody else, if you've offended them and you will not get right with them, is to kick you out of the church. Well, how can you kick somebody out of the church? I hate to say it that way. How can you dismiss somebody from the church if they will not join the church? It is a given in Matthew chapter 18 that every believer be a part of his local church. All right, let's go on. Also, a church is independent because it settles its own internal conflicts. 1 Corinthians 6.1, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? And verse 5 says, I speak this, or I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. How many of you have known a Christian that has sued another Christian? Anybody? All right. Let me tell you something. Biblically, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 1, it should never happen in civil situations. The biblical mandate, and this is proving that a church is independent and it doesn't need outside sources or outside presbytery even to settle its own conflicts. If there are people in the church, in this church, that have a civil suit against someone else, all right, um, something happened, something happened on your property, something happened in your vehicle, whatever, a civil suit, not a criminal case, a civil case, you ought to settle that among the church. 
Now in the day of insurance companies, insurance companies settle those things. But if there's a, an occasion where it is a personal situation, you, you need, according to the Word of God, to get a wise man that you both can agree, agree on in this church, or a couple wise men, and sit down, them as, ar down as arbitrators and allow them to decide your case for you. And you live under that understanding. You ought not take your brother to court. In criminal cases, that's a government issue. I know of a church in Chicago that took this verse as a, in, in a criminal manner, and there was a, uh, a very improper abuse situation within their church. And they did not prosecute the man because they said that it should stay with inside the church. The only problem was about 20 years later it happened again. Okay? That's not, criminal cases need to go straight to court. All right? But if you have a problem with somebody within your church, it should be settled within the church, which points to the power of the independence of the local church. Leaders represent their own church. The last argument here of what is a church biblically. It's independent because leaders, not a presbytery, represent their own church. In Titus 1.5, it talks about with the verse we just looked at, that thou shouldest ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. The local church is to appoint their own leaders who shepherd them and who lead them. Matthew 18, as we talked about there, that two shall agree together. It shows that there are there is uh, authority within the local church to decide their own matters. A verse that, and we'll close with this, but a verse that I think is very interesting is Philippians 4.15. Do you know sometimes in scripture that Paul whines about, kind of whines about churches not supporting him? I mean, it's biblical inspired whining, but he says, you should be supporting me. I'm ministering to you spiritually, etc. Here is a church like that. In Philippians 4.15 it says, Now ye Philippians know also, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. What do I, why does this show independence? You help me out here, Dan. Why does this show independence that only one church in all of Christendom gave financially to Paul? Why does that show the independence of the local church? They each had a choice, they each had a choice Bob. There was the apostle who could shake off snakes, poisonous snakes into fires and do miracles and do wonders and write the word of God. Jesus Christ did not give him the ability to require that local church churches sent him money. He was submitted to the authority of the local churches. There's only one church. You know, I think it's kind of funny. The churches must be a lot like our churches today. There's only one church that gave him money, okay, which shows that they each had a choice of their own finances. I want to end tonight just by asking you, what role will you allow your local church to do in your life? I started with a testimony of how incredible, how my local church, Faith Baptist Church, Morgantown, West Virginia, shaped my life tremendously in all good ways, and uh, in many good ways, although we saw some bad stuff. How will you allow it to shape your family? How will you allow it to shape your children? How will you allow it to shape your grandchildren? Will you allow Jesus Christ, local church, to help shape your life?